Tonight, we have the pleasure of introducing Ed Gilbert. Ed is a fourth year PhD student at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, and his research is interested in the genetic ancestry and history of the populations within the British Isles and Ireland, in particular Ireland and Scotland. Tonight, he will be talking about how the genetic landscape of the Isles has shaped has been shaped by successive migrations and the boundaries of historical kingdoms. And with that, we would like to hand the floor over to him. Please give him a warm welcome. Yeah, you can hear me. Excellent. Thank you for such a lovely introduction. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Ed Gilbert. Um, and I am a fourth year PhD student. Um, and what I do is study population genetics. So the genetic differences between groups of individuals um, because uh, they're populations. So the work that I'm going to be presenting tonight is as a result of collaboration between uh, us in RCSI in Dublin um, and the University of Edinburgh. Um, but, um, quite nicely given us a load of samples to analyze. Um, and many others um, who have uh, uh, given other samples so we can have this full genetic map of um, Britain and Ireland that you're going to see. So what this work is, is um, kind of a, well we hope, uh, a nice comprehensive um, sampling of the population uh, structure and genetics of Britain and Ireland. And what hopefully I can uh, convince you that history really does impact the genomic landscape. Um, you can see all kinds of stories emerge when you look at people's genomes. So first of all, um, thank you to a lot of people that have helped uh, make this possible. Um, for a full list to see this slide. So first of all, let's just introduce population genetics. So population genetics arises just because we all vary as human beings. So if we take two random people from this room, about one in a thousand uh, letters in their genomes will vary. So your genomes are about three billion um, letters long. And about one in a thousand between them on average will be different. And, that difference, and those differences aren't entirely random, they're structured. So yeah, the types and frequencies of these genetic variants differ within <coughs> populations and between populations. So this is a heat map of one particular mutation. Um, the warmer the colour, um, the more frequent that mutation is in the world. And you can see that it's most common within Britain, specifically Ireland. And this mutation is a single letter change um, just before a gene called LCT. What it does is mean that you can, um, LCT uh, keeps getting produced as an adult and you can digest milk into adulthood. So digesting milk is quite a, as an adult is quite weird in the animal kingdom, but humans have um, have uh, developed a number of different not developed evolved a number of different mutations that allow them to continue drinking into adulthood, and this is one of them. This is the European version, um, and you can see it's most common within Europe. So even um, taking uh, specific mutations, you can start to see that there are genetic differences around the world, and by identifying these genetic variations and kind of studying them, you can start to learn about um, the genetic history of a population. Yeah, that's what I said. So, the source of these genetic vary, um, differences. Between, in, within population genetics, there are kind of four kind of canonical sources of um, variation. You've got selection, which the LCT um, mutation uh, will have been affected by selection. And then, of course, you've got the underlying just mutational um, behavior of the genome as new mutations get um, added on successive generations. So, for example, the Y chromosomes um, given, over couple, um, given over generations will start to become different just because new mutations um, arise on that Y chromosome, for example. But the two main ones that I want to talk, to do, talk today um, um, to do with this talk, one of them is genetic drift. And this is just simply the process of that different populations kind of genetically isolate themselves away from each other. And that's because these, ice, these populations aren't breeding um, between, or at least breeding, preferentially breeding within that population. And this is because every generation you get a random sample of the genetic variation from the last generation. Some people will be very successful and have lots of children, so their genomes, the, the variants that they carry in their genome, is going to be um, more frequent the next generation. And some people just aren't very successful, so they don't have a lot of children or maybe none, no children at all. So, for example, if we take this population of kind of simplified individuals into uh, just three types of genomes, you can think of these as just one mutation. So you've got three types, a green mutation, an orange mutation, and a purple mutation. So this is one generation. So I think we're going to cover, we're going to follow the orange mutation. 
Yes, we are. So, next generation, you can see by chance, possibly the um, orange mutation just becomes a little bit more frequent. The individual that carries that mutation just becomes <coughs> more dual than the others. And you can see the, um, the frequency of this allele changes. And then within a one or two couple of generations, you can see that these frequencies can change. So this frequency change is specific to a population. And also this effect is more pronounced in smaller populations. That's why small populations like or um, Orkney or Shetland are quite interesting to study, because this drift is more pronounced, because that random sampling is more uh, pronounced within a smaller population i.e. it's more likely that you can get quite a different frequency change per generation. So for example, in this example, for example, in this uh, version, we've completely lost the green allele. And then within a couple of generations, we may only have um, one specific allele, and this is a process called fixation. And of course, this can be, um, this process is kind of unique for every population. So for example, this population instead has purple. And you can tell, therefore, these two different populations. One has a different genetic history than the other. That's essentially a simplified explanation of um, the drifting of these populations apart. So as an example of uh, how you can visualize this genetic drift, there's a paper back in 2008. There's a genetic analysis of 3,000 European individuals. And they did this analysis called principal component analysis. But this is just simply a, um, a dimension reducing analysis where you try to summarize the entirety of the, hum, um, uh, entirety of the genetic variation in the human genome. Um, and you try to uh, uh, condense it into uh, dimensions. So is someone very much one way or, sorry, or very much another way, genetically speaking? So you can get these kind of uh, two-way um, two scatter plots uh, along one a principal component one and a principal component two, for example. So each one of these dots represents one individual and they're color-coded according to the country that they were born from. And you can see that once you start looking at all these um, sites across the genome, there's about 600,000 um, different letter changes in the genome, you can start to see patterns arise. And you can start to see the geography of Europe mirrored in the genes of Europe as well. So you have um, the Iberian Peninsula down here, the Italian Balkans, Northeast, Central, um, Europe, and then over here in kind of this pink and red, you've got Ireland and Britain, as well as some Scottish samples. So, in, this is because people that are more closely related are obviously going to share more of similar genetic um, frequencies or variants. And that's why um, you can visualize this as they're genetically closer together. And then obviously, on the other hand, you can separate these populations that have different genetic histories. So then we have these drift regions drifting apart. So the other process, other than genetic drift, which is kind of like uh, the, the genetic history of a population on its own, you've got admixture, <coughs> which is the mixing of two ancestries, two populations colliding and creating a hybrid population between them. So for example, we've got one or two populations joining to make a third population. And these population admixtures don't have to be equal, they can be unequal, so you can have a hybrid population, so maybe 30%, one population is 70% the other population. But also, they can be predominantly driven by either male or female. So you can have a population that's mainly made up of males from one population and females from another population. And uh, Agnol will be talking uh, about uh, that sort of population uh, later. So this is an example of uh, the visualization that you can do with um, admixture. So this is uh, a paper back in 2001. What they did was look at Y chromosome types across Britain and then comparing them to Y chromosomes found in different regions in Europe. So you've got Germany up here and uh, Norway up here, and this is the rest of Britain over here. You can see that most of uh, Britain looks quite similar to each other. But then you've got Orkney and Shetland, which is somewhere in between Norway and somewhere in between Britain. Almost as if they're a kind of a hybrid population of these two. So this is perhaps a marker, or is a marker, for this Viking admixture that's happened in Orkney and Shetland. So before we started doing this work, um, what did we know about population genetics of Britain and Ireland in general anyway? So you can look at multiple genetic loci, which was done in the 90s. So not rather than those 600,000 sites as you saw in, back in 2008, this is kind of uh, 13 maybe sites. And you can see these genetic boundaries. So what, what are happening, these lines are representing, uh, on either side of this, of this barrier, people are, more, are genetically different. There is a genetic barrier between these individuals. And you can see the different regions of Britain and Ireland separate out. You've got Wales from England, Cornwall from England, uh, 
got Orkney and then Shetland, and then obviously you've got some lines separating away from Ireland. So this is one way to identify genetic regions. But then, if you skip forward a couple of years, you start working on Y chromosomes, which is a marker for the male genetic history. And this is a relatively simple genetic system compared to, say, the whole genome, which is the vast majority of the genetic um, material that's in our genome. So you've got these types of Y chromosomes called haplotypes, and then the families of these haplotypes called haplogroups. And so, for example, within Orkney, we've got this nice, uh, this uh, nice other um, visual representation of that admixture that's happened. If you look at Ireland and Wales, these Celtic populations, you can see similar types of Y chromosomes. And then within Orkney, you have those types of Y chromosomes, but within Orkney, you also have these Y chromosomes that are common within Norway. So then we start working on the autosome, the majority of the genome, about 99%, and the sort are organized into over 22 chromosomes. And obviously, you get 50% from your mum, 50% from your dad. And this is more data, it's more complex, but because there's more data, you get a lot more detail out of it. And you, start, you can start to then reveal fine-scale genetic structure. So you see that map of um, Europe that I showed you? That's kind of the, the genetic structure across um, a continent. But now we're able to start working at genetic structure at a regional level within a country. So this is an example of that. So this is a paper back in 2015, where they did this sample of what well, they say Britain Island, um, or Britain, but it's mostly England and a lot of Wales, but you can see that Scotland is not well described, and then Ireland is just this kind of light grey colour, and it's just not really, uh, not really um, used at all. And then obviously they don't have Shetland at all. So we decided um, to fill in these gaps and actually have a <coughs> genetic map of all of Britain and Ireland, rather than England, Wales, and Ireland, and Scotland. So we started sampling the island, so we started um, and gathering all of these uh, genetic data sets together. So what we did was take 2,500 um, 2, British, British and Irish individuals. We didn't just randomly take them from the street. We wanted um, individuals with ancestry from specific regions. And the way you can do that is get individuals that have all of their grandparents or all of their great grandparents, if you're lucky enough, um, to be born from a specific um, from form within the same um, region. So within maybe like 50 or 80 kilometers, or within the same parish, for example. And so. Gathering all those individuals together, you start to then have a genomic landscape, an atlas of the genetic diversity of an area. So this map shows each dot is one individual that we use in our analyses, and they're placed at where their grandparents or great-grandparents were from. You can see that we've got this nice kind of description of all the islands, um, of um, Britain and Ireland and the rest. So you've got um, a lot of these dots from England and Wales that are familiar, that's because we took those British samples and then added our own uh, Scottish and Irish samples, as well as Shetland and um, some better Orcadian samples. So we've got seven different cohorts in this study. It's really a nice collaborative effort. So we've got Generation Scotland. So we took um, individuals uh, that are mainly from Scotland, but we also took some individuals from the north of Ireland. Um, interestingly, within this cohort, there are quite a lot of individuals that have ancestry specifically from Donegal, which is this um, the northwestern county um, that's still in the Republic. And then we've got the Irish Danialis, which is the cohort that um, I predominantly work on in my PhD. So that's our Irish sample. We've got Orcades, that's um, sampling Orkney. We've got Viking, which is sampling um, Shetland. We've got this uh, cohort called Scotland, which is uh, predominantly uh, sampling the Western Isles of Scotland. I've also got the people of the British Isles, which is sampling both England, Wales, and a little bit of Scotland. And then we've got this Isle of Man study. So we've got some of the first descriptions of the uh, population genetics of the Isle of Man in the study as well. So, let's go on to the results, because they're interesting, um, uh, much more interesting than me just blathering on about the history of population genetics in Britain. So what we did was run fine-scale clustering analysis. What we did was compare individuals um, and compare their genetic similarity to each other. And then from that genetic similarity matrix, uh, we uh, organized them into genetic clusters, identifying the subpopulations of Britain and Ireland. What we did was identify actually 65 of these clusters, but some of these clusters are really small. They're maybe one or two individuals. And they're probably uh, representing quite cryptic related relatedness. So maybe these individuals are related a couple of ways quite distantly, but it's enough to, for this analysis to group them into their own tiny little cluster. So what we did was just group those smaller clusters together into the larger clusters, because they're not really informative of the population history of Britain and Ireland. So then we've got these 43 what we call merged clusters. 
So this, are, this is um, the 65 or 43 clusters, it's a bit complicated, but each of one of these dots represents one of those final 65. And then if they've got the same color scheme, then um, we've merged them together. So for example, we've got three little clusters or two little clusters and one big cluster that we then do in England. I try to color code them according to kind of uh, broad genetic region. And what we've done is take all of those clusters and all organize them hierarchically in a tree. And this is grouping together clusters that are genetically related to each other. So we've got groups of clusters as well. So groups of individuals and then groups of groups of individuals. So we have England. We've got Wales over here. We've got Scotland, quite a lot of structure within Scotland. And then we've got Ireland, and Green, obviously. Um, and then we've got Orkney and then Shetland. And you can see that Orkney and Shetland are on their completely own separate branch. It's because Orkney and Shetland have, one, remained quite isolated. But presumably that, uh, that Norwegian admixture is also creating that genetic distance from everyone else as well. So this is uh, an example of principal, uh, principal components analysis that I showed you with those Europeans or those uh, Y chromosomes um, within Orkney between uh, <coughs> Norway and Britain. And you can see, so each one of these dots again represents one individual and I've color coded them according to their groups. So the coloring scheme, if like, you've been staring at these plots like I have for a couple of months, I know kind of I can see where they are, but for you guys that are just seeing this. So this is England in red over here. And then we've got Wales in green, kind of doing the same thing over here. And then Scotland are in kind of in between, in blue. And then we've got Ireland kind of tracing away in yellow. Um, these Irish individuals are really kind of uh, tracing away. They're from Donegal, so we were actually really lucky getting those um, samples from uh, Generation Scotland, otherwise we wouldn't have been aware of this structure within Ireland. And then, which is more interesting for you guys, this is the Northern Isles. So you've got uh, Shetland, I'm sorry, Orkney up here. You've got actually two bands um, up here, and then that's Shetland on the bottom band. And we've also got some interesting individuals in between. So these individuals, so these dark blue individuals are kind of halfway in between Scotland and Orkney and Shetland. And then also these orange individuals, these are upside down triangles. So these blue individuals are from the right top um, northern tip of Scotland, kind of Cape Ness and Sutherland. And they look to be a hybrid population between Scotland and between Orkney, which would kind of make sense uh, given the histori um, historical, they, they were under the um, yardum of um, Orkney. So, oh, spoiler alert, oh, we've got a lot of those today. So, what happens if we take these clusters and instead map them on the geography of Britain and Ireland? You do get a map, as you just saw. So this is, I'm going to deal with um, Orkney and Shetland on their own, just over this, and give them their proper, their proper due of attention. But this is just the, uh, the boring map of the rest of Britain and Ireland, so just bear with me. Um, so this is um, England in red over here, you've got North and South Wales. The Isle of Man is uh, genetically related, or our sample, the best close... Uh, close population for the Isle of Man are these uh, southwest Scots in light blue, and then you've got the northeast Scots in these dark blue, and then the Hebrides, both the outer and then the inner, and then islands in yellow. And there's come some quite interesting stories uh, within this map even. So you've got this north, uh, northeast southwest divide in Scottish genetics, um, kind of going down the, uh, the River Forth, it's about the greatest amount of resolution that we can try and work out. It's quite an interesting and quite neat genetic barrier as well. And we've got these, uh, this, of the southwest Scottish individuals, we've got three main groups. This group that's kind of orange and blue, that's mostly found across from like Argyll and those kind of islands, or peninsulas. And then you've got the Isle of Man, and this light blue here. And then you've got this uh, light blue and yellow, which is uh, found both in the southwest of Scotland, but also within the northeast of Ireland. And we've done several analyses using, uh, focusing on Irish genetics as well. And you really do see this kind of Scottish kind of admixture and, and movement um, from Scotland into the northeast of Ireland, kind of a proxy for the, uh, presumably, the, the, um, the plantations that occurred within um, the northeast of Ulster. Um, and then within the northeast of um, Scotland, you've got these different genetic groups uh, um, separating away. And then we've got the inner and the, oh, sorry, the inner and then the outer Hebrides as well separating away. So there's an amazing amount of structure, especially down the west coast of Scotland, that we've never really seen before because we've never really had the samples together in one place to be able to do this sort of analysis. Oh yes, we've got England, Wales, Scotland, so just what I said. 
So, North, um, so the Northern Isles. So we've got extensive structure across the island. So imagine all this structure. This structure is also found within Northern Isles from an island to island basis. It's extraordinary. So we've got individual islands separated away from rocks. So for example, our four samples of North Isles, and usually if you have four samples from a population compared to everyone else, you wouldn't really be able to differentiate them away. But even so, Northeast Ronaldsey, for oh, North Ronaldsey, for example, is completely separated away from these other, um, these, other, these other islands. And you can see all the other different islands separate away from each other, which is pretty damn impressive. And then within Shetland, it's a similar story. So, for example, Fair Isle in between Orkney and Shetland, genetically, they cluster both um, better with uh, Shetland rather than Orkney. But then you've also got this structure within, say, the mainland of Shetland as well, but also within um, individual islands, so kind of Wolsey, for example, uh, and Oakston Yale. So, what, so the, pro, the plot that I showed you are principal components. The principal component analysis will uh, generate a number of different dimensions. So, uh, maybe, well, if you're using population genetics, you may generate uh, 20 principal posts, for example. So we tried another different analysis that's another type of dimension reducing analysis. Um, it's kind of uh, used a little bit of machine learning, it's called TSNE. And what this does is reduce it down to only two dimensions. It tries to um, uh, summarize all of those uh, 20, 50 principal components, for example, and tries to summarize it down into two components. And when you do this analysis, you can really start to see the geography of Britain and Ireland really reflected in this genetic variation. So it's a little bit clearer if we rotate the plot slightly. So this is England, you've got Cornwall down here, Wales, Isle of Man in between the north of England, um, and Ireland in the southwest of Scotland. You've got this northeast and southwest divide in the Scottish genetics. So you've got the borders, so region between England and uh, Scotland, really bridging the gap between England and Scotland. You've got Ireland, so Ireland is a really nice map of Irish genetics where you've got the northeast over here, all the way down to the south. Um, sorry, the northwest over there, down to the south in Munster. And then you've got these individuals that are kind of a mixture between Irish and Scottish genetics, kind of bridging those two lines together. And you've got the Hebrides, and then you've got Orkney and Shetland kind of doing their own thing um, north of the plot, um, together but separate um, from each other as well. So we've got this kind of genetic latitude and longitude now. So then we start to look at the genetic ancestry of Britain and Ireland. So although Britain and Ireland are quite genetically isolated, so for example, if France has had lots of migrations, for example, you can um, visualize um, the different ways that you can get into France um, from different parts of Europe. But Britain and Ireland are relatively isolated away from each other, um, from the uh, continent of Europe. But nevertheless, there has been migrations in the past, famously uh, the Vikings or the Anglo-Saxons, for example. So then what we did was look at European ancestry across Britain and Ireland. So we looked at whether certain regions of Britain and Ireland have more ancestry from a particular region in, um, in Europe um, than other regions in Britain and Ireland. So for example, are there places in Britain and Ireland that are more Norwegian than other places? So to do this, we took a load of English, um, a load of European samples, all across kind of um, the, the regions around Britain and Ireland, and you can see the different kind of sampling areas that we, uh, that we sampled. And then what we did was uh, model our Irish and British individuals as a mixture of these European sources. So do we have a migration, can we detect a migration from, uh, from Norway, for example, or Germany? So this is the map, oh, this is the, the kind of plot. So along the x-axis, you've got all of the 43 different groups, um, the genetic groups of Britain and Ireland, and they're grouped according to uh, kind of our main branch, so Wales, England, North East Scotland, uh, Ireland, South West Scotland, Hebrides, Orkney, and Shetland. And they're grouped and ordered on this blue bar. So each of these bars represents the proportion of ancestry for, that, for, for example, South West Wales that looks either French, uh, Belgian, German, uh, Danish, Swedish, or uh, Norway. And you can see that there are some populations, such as Finland, which is very genetically isolated anyway, that just don't really uh, um, give an appreciable <coughs> level of ancestry to um, this to any of regions within Britain and Ireland. And you can see that there are three main signals within Britain and Ireland. You've got the signal in red, which is uh, uh, putatively French ancestry. And that's really being driven by, a, um, um, by particular individuals within France, which I'll get to on the next slide. And then you've got this German ancestry, which is unsurprisingly quite large in, um, in England. 
And then you've got this blue ancestry, which is really high in Shetland, which is Norwegian ancestry. Also, you've got quite a lot of Danish ancestry within England, but not other regions. Um, you've got some rare regions within Shetland, for example, but it's highest within England, which is pre um, presumably reflecting kind of like the day law within England. <coughs> so, this is just kind of country level resolution, but there are regions within each of these different European countries that uh, provo um, donate more ancestry more than the other regions. They're predominantly coming from specific regions around, around Europe. So for example, our French ancestry component, which is highest within our Celtic population, so it's highest within Ireland, or highest within uh, Wales, for example, and it's, not, and it's found its lowest, for example, within uh, England, although with the exception of Cornwall, which is quite Celtic uh, population within England. Most of that's coming from northwest France. We've, um, it, that ancestry is being driven by individuals that have ancestry from the northwestern tip of France. And that's Brittany, um, this kind of Celtic isolate within French genetics. So we're thinking that this, uh, this signal is kind of uh, a proxy for Celtic, the Celtic ancestry. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's kind of like the Celtic corner of, um, of Britain and Ireland. Our German ancestry in this analysis is predominantly from individuals from, uh, from the northwest of Germany, so it's kind of this Anglo -Saxon, or Saxon influence. And then our Norwegian ancestry, the mo majority of this ancestry is coming from the north northwest coast of Norway, i.e. kind of where the Vikings set sail from. So if you map these individuals, so each of these dots, remember, is represents one British or Irish individuals, you can see the three genetic corners of Britain and Ireland. You see French ancestry that's predominantly on the west, kind of all these Celtic populations such as um, Cornwall, Wales, Ireland, kind of the west coast of Scotland as well. German ancestry, which is very common within um, England, but it's much lower within other regions of um, the Isles, and the Norwegian ancestry, which is really quite common in, uh, <coughs> speaking, within Shetland, it kind of goes down a little bit in Orkney, and it goes down a little bit more in the, uh, uh, the Hebrides, and it kind of follows and tracks the kind of the, uh, the distribution of the, um, the Vikings. So then, it wouldn't be a kind of a talk from Jim's uh, group without Ramos and Homos Augusti, or RHs. So what we did was look at RHs within Britain and Ireland as well. So for those that weren't at the RRH talk, um, RRHs are just regions of the genome where both of your copies are identical. Both the copies, um, the copy from your mum, the copy of your dad, are basically the same copy. And that's because eventually they've come back from the same ancestor. And so if that ancestor between your parents was very recent, that RRH is going to be quite long. But if that um, ancestor is very distant in the past, um, that RRH is going to be uh, quite short. So it's a, ver it's a good um, marker for demographic history within the population. Start looking for the rise of homo zygosity within the population. As I've just said. So RHs are ubiquitous as well. As we all know we're all related at some degree of level. Um, and these RHs, if a population has a lot of R, um, a lot of short RHs but not a lot of long RHs, that means that they've uh, it's probably experienced some sort of bottleneck in its past. And then if you've got longer RHs, it's more re uh, more um, representative of more recent demographic events. So, for example, recent um, endogamy, or just a very small population size uh, within the last five generations or so. So, this is the ROH levels across the islands. A bit of a complicated plot, but this is essentially four plots next to each other, and they're the levels of um, the average uh, mean levels of ROHs across all of these different populations. So, that's England, Wales, Isle of Man, Ireland, and Green, again, uh, the Northeast Scotland, Southwest Scotland. That's the Hebrides, and then Orkney and Shetland. And it's across four different uh, length categories. So this is uh, summing all of the, the ROHs that are at least one million base pairs long, and then it's 2.5 million base pairs long, then it's five, and progressively getting longer and longer. So you're only, at this end of the plot, you're only considering ROHs that are quite long. And you can see that one, all the populations have um, levels of ROHs. Some populations have more, so for example, Orkney and Shetland, um, and these short RHs are presumably due to the, 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 the small town population history um, back in the past of Orkney and Shetland. You've got low levels, for example, within England that has traditionally have a larger population. But you've also got this uh, la um, uh, larger amount of runs of Homer's Zagosti within uh, the west coast of Scotland as well, and the southwest of Scotland, but also within Wales and also within Ireland. So these kind of the outer reaches of um, the peripheries of um, Britain and Ireland have these kind of short ROHs. 
And then within uh, Orkney and Shetland in particular, there's this kind of uh, high level, kind of like mid-range uh, ROHs. But then when you get down to kind of longer ROHs, they have a little bit more, but it's not a, a large amount of these long ROHs. If we zoom in to the specific regions of Orkney and Shetland, you can see that there's, uh, there's variation between these different groups uh, within Orkney. So for example, this green color is uh, North Ronaldsey. So you can see that North Ronaldsey has quite a lot of these shorter ROHs, but it doesn't have, that pattern doesn't remain when we deal with the longer ROHs. So probably North Ronaldsey has gone through a bottleneck at some point during its history, but that doesn't seem to have applied within the last couple of generations. And then if we go to Shetland, we've got, oh yeah, so you might have been uh, uh, paying attention to the scale differences as well. So 50 is at the top of this plot, and then when we deal with Orkney, it's now down to 80. And then when we get to Shetland, it's up to 160. But this is mostly being driven by one particular cluster. So there is also variation between within Orkney, um, within Shetland, sorry. And this cluster is uh, Ferrar, so the most isolated um, island um, in all of the northern parts. And you can see that this is representative across all the different um, bank categories. And it's just representative of the small population of Ferrar. So I'm going to kind of leave the talk with a little bit of talk of um, ancient DNA. It's kind of like the new sexy thing within population genetics. Um, so what we did was, now that we've got this genetic landscape of Britain and Ireland, can we use that to, uh, to explore um, the genomes of ancient individuals that are related to these populations? So what we did was take some ancient gales that were found in Iceland, and we wanted to ask, could we, um, could we see uh, any regions of Britain and Ireland that they share more genetic drift with? So are they more, uh, more genetically similar to some populations within Britain and Ireland uh, than others? So this is seven of those individuals. So the warmer the color, the more, um, the more genetically similar they are. You can see there are some patterns amongst some of the individuals. Some of the individuals aren't. So we're just going to figure, um, focus on the individuals that are a little bit more clean. So these individuals. So you can see there's a, a, there's a, a slight pattern of um, a tendency to uh, share genetic drift with these Western Isles and kind of like this area of um, Scotland or Ireland. There are some kind of variation between individuals. So for example, this individual, um, the most individuals share kind of like within the north of Ireland if they share within the north of Ireland, um, within Ireland. But there's also some individuals that share kind of like with the south of Ireland instead. So we're starting to be able to uh, look at kind of the, uh, give tentative uh, ex um, descriptions of maybe where these individuals are starting to come, uh, come from, from Ireland or Scotland into Iceland. And we're looking further into this at the moment. So to kind of conclude the talk and give you some time to um, ask me and terrorize me uh, the genetic landscape of Britain and Ireland uh, really does reflect the history of the islands. It's kind of like reading a history book, but it's within the genome instead. And so we've done that by describing the genetic landscape of Britain and Ireland. We've identified these three genetic corners, kind of uh, the, the, the Celtic corner of the west, the Viking corner to the north, and the Saxon corner to the southeast. And the RHs also reflect the population histories of these groups as well. So thank you all very much for listening. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ed, for a fantastic talk. We now welcome any questions. talk but certainly the in your conclusions that you say the genetic landscape reflects the history of uh, the Isles and in in general over the talk the the results do reflect the history but how useful is this kind of genetic science if most of it could be pieced together from the history of migration in the records so the different type of research into the genetics of disease, for example. So when we take this large sample, the British Isles, generally it's kind of like taking 
uh, samples from the easily sampled areas, so like the cities, like the, the main regions of Britain and Ireland. So if we just go back to the, the map, it's probably easier with the map. It's always easy. So, okay. So there are some, oh, obviously there are these large samples in Northern Mars, for example. But say, for example, the UK Biobank, really large uh, sample of the genetics of Britain and Ireland, or of Britain, sorry. Um, but it's mostly within this red cluster. This genetic structure within the Hebrides or the west of Scotland, that's going to be uh, a whole new type of genetic variation. It's just not going to be picked up by these analyses. And by getting this sample, it's really nice to also get the history and that's measured by the genetics. But also, as if you're studying this one to study that history, you also want to sample all the different subpopulations. But by sampling these subpopulations, you do realize about this genetic variation. So this genetic variation is just not being sampled by these studies. So there are a lot of variants that are maybe these rare, potent variants that have a re like a, a quite a, a strong effect on a disease state, and they're just not going to be picked up because they're rare enough to have stayed within these populations and are just not being found by pop uh, by sampling schemes in say London, for example. So yeah, that's that's one useful thing. I'm looking at the uh, coloured dots in the south um, west of Scotland and Northern Ireland and you said that uh, it could be the, did you call it the plantations when people from Scotland went, yeah. were forced, well, just moved in on Northern Ireland? Yeah, there was a movement of people. Yes, there was a movement of people. <laughs> but there was a much earlier movement of people um, creating that... Um, Kingdom called uh, was it Dalriata? So Dalriata is uh, the kingdom. It's mostly within the western coast of uh, of Scotland. It wasn't this area. So this area is Strathclyde, right? Yeah. Thank you. I do. I have learned something during this picture. Um, so this western coast up here. So actually, really interestingly, so that that kingdom was also shared amongst the yeah, the northeast of Ireland. But it looks to have been, or at least the the ancestral pool of that of that those people looks to be displaced, but we've got one individual, so one from the tip of Northern Ireland up here, that's part of the same genetic group that's here. And this is, that, 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 that person's genetically Scottish, not Irish, and it's within the same sort of dis, uh, kind of distribution of that kingdom. So it might be a proxy for that kind of, that group of people. Um, but yeah, it, seemed, it would seem that that's, that cluster, which we call Argyle, is, um, would be a better fit for that, um, for that people, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you, Ed, that was uh, enlightening. Um, earlier on in your lecture, when you were splitting the uh, British Isles up into clusters, I think if I remember right, you had many more clusters for Shetland than you did for Orkney. Yes. Yes, there. Um, yet the population of Orkney is, is traditionally a lot bigger than, than Shetland, so you would expect more diversity within, within Orkney. How do you reconcile that? Uh, well, we also sampled, I think we sampled maybe 20 or 50 more individuals, no, maybe 20 individuals more than Shetland. But there are I think it's more of a, yeah, the sample size. So a lot of these samples, so I, I mentioned at the beginning that we kind of collapse some of the larger clusters because up some of the small clusters into a larger cluster. Didn't really want to do that within Orkney and Shetland, mostly just because the scale of the structure between different islands is just too important to pass up. Um, so, but yeah, so there seems to be just quite a lot of more genetic structure within, within Shetland. Maybe just more less less movement, or that we have just a slightly larger sample of Shetland as well. So it could be less internal movement. Less internal movement within Shetland, possibly. Yeah. Any other oh, questions? Oh, we just have lots. No, no, no. Just my friends. Uh, very interesting. Uh, one of the 
questions I got is the ROH, does the increasing ROH value indicate more sort of um, uh, internal, uh, internal variations by intermarriages? Are we is it more in breeding with higher ROH values? Is that what causes it? So the R, yeah, the R, well, not in breeding. Yeah, so the, the, <laughs> <laughs> um, the higher ROHs are reflected with small population. So small population doesn't, they, it just means that you're more, it's kind of background relatedness. So you've just, you're more, you're related to individuals by far more different groups just because of small sample size and the kind of the less uh, the less ancestors that actual ancestors you have you've got the kind of that pedigree collapse that Jim was talking about so that that basically will just inflate the ROH even though the, it's there's no kind of like first or second cousin kind of marriages within the culture it's just a kind of a measure of that small population size I have an example of that like I am from Bushwick and there's someone on the internet I know that is related to me and it's something close to being a fifth cousin five times over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so exactly. Yeah. That, that would be a high ROH. Yeah, so that's, that's going to kind of, yeah, that will. Any more questions? Can we have another big hand for Ed Gilbert, please?